Michael Deaver, one of Ronald Reagan's closest aides and friends, said that he would watch that video over and over again. Clicking rewind, then play. Maybe to reduce his own trauma. Maybe to look for sense in something that was illogical. Rewind, play. He was always struck by one thing, Reagan's face. Brim, full of life, his classic smile, and in a millisecond, it all changes. In 1981, President Ronald Reagan makes a speech at the Washington Hilton Hotel to the AFL-CIO, the country's largest union organization. And it's not a friendly crowd. The economy in 1981 was not bright. High inflation, high unemployment, 7% at the time. Trade and public unions were skeptical of Reagan's economic plan. Newspapers, too. Reaganomics. Yet a good number of union members voted for Reagan. Hence the speech. We were still getting our sea legs as an administration, Chief of Staff Jim Baker said. The speech was about persuasion. And the president tried. He told the AFL-CIO attendees that he was a member of the AFL-CIO too. And that he once headed up a union. Nothing dramatic. A few weeks earlier, the president had laughed with newspaper reporters and celebrities at the gridiron dinner in the very hotel. Minutes from the White House, the Hilton was safe. The hotel had put in a special passageway after the JFK assassination, and today, Reagan, Secret Service code name Rawhide, would simply walk down the hallway from the exit on T Street Northwest a few paces into the limo. Code name Stagecoach. Now here's where a camera in slow-mo close-up could do a better job than me. Because Reagan's going to walk right past a very clean-cut looking, normal looking man who is deranged. Right past him. And in those seconds, the deranged man decides it is his chance. Reagan has no idea. The Secret Service agents are in diamond formation. They have no idea. All anyone sees is a rope line with media, cameras, reporters, etc., the normal. And when the words, Mr. President, are heard, it's like any other moment of a presidency. Cameras following around. The president turns and his arm raises in the air. It sounded like little firecrackers going off, Deaver said. The smell of sulfur told me something different. Reagan has time to say, what the hell is that? Before the pain starts. (laughs) 20, maybe 30 seconds. That's all the whole thing is. It is complete and total chaos for all. In seconds, decisions must be made. Drop down. Where's the threat? Yet muscle memory, training, Special Agent Parr takes Reagan, pushes him into the back of the presidential limo. It's like the shooter wants to empty the gun as soon as possible. Shot one hits Press Secretary James Brady, and he's lying face down. Shot two hits D.C. police officer Thomas Delaney. Shot three hits Special Agent Tim McCarthy. Out of this stupid, illogical chaos comes a test of the Republic. Agent Tim McCarthy, the first, the only, to jump in the line of fire in front of an American president. And he goes down, reeling in pain. Everyone, including the president on this day, could have worn bulletproof vests. 
It just wasn't part of this operation. Something happens in shot five or maybe shot six. Maybe it's after this. It's a play of milliseconds. Alfred and Tucci, a carpenter from Cleveland, Ohio, sees the gun in the deranged man's hand. No one, he says, is going to shoot the president in front of me. And the 68-year-old former carpenter strikes Hinckley repeatedly in the head. The limo door is not yet shut. The fifth shot hits the bulletproof window. And the sixth, we think, ricochets off the door and goes, well, nobody knows. Half-minute mark. A Secret Service agent is on top of Hinckley now. He wants to make sure no one is going to do to him what was done to Oswald, he remembers thinking. Another covers the area with an Uzi. If this is a group attack, if this is some kind of conspiracy, if this is the work of the Soviet Union or terrorists, he's ready. Cars on the walkie-talkie. Rawhide is okay. I'm heading to Crown. Crown is the White House. Stagecoach speeds off. My job, Agent Parr would say later, was to see if he'd really been hit. I ran my hands under his coat, around his belt line, and I started working up to the armpit back of his neck. I didn't see blood at all. But about Dupont Circle, the president started spitting blood. Bright red frothy blood. And I just decided... We know the stock market falls when the president goes to a hospital, but I just decided. He orders the driver to go to George Washington University Medical Center. This is all happening in the nation's capital, so it takes about 20 minutes before footage is on the air. A wobbly camera, people with gray suits, big guns, screaming. Frank Reynolds tells America, This is the first time many of us have seen this footage, Reynolds said. Three persons on the ground, James Brady in the foreground, closest to you, uh, closest to the camera. Here come the ambulances. They are grabbing the assailant, a young white male. Uh, Please understand, this is not live. This is a videotape. The president was put in a car and sped off to the White House. Of course, nobody knows about the different plans right now. Michael Deaver had ridden with the president in the limo. But when the shots are fired, he goes to go into the limo. Uh Uh-uh. Under fire, stagecoach is locked. No one's allowed in. He gets into another limo that follows the presidential limo, but there's radio silence. Still, it's obvious, eventually, to him, they're not going to the White House, and that something might be wrong with the president. That's not what the nation's TV audience is hearing. Frank Reynolds rambles. It appears this man was just off to the right. God, you tremble to think he had such a clear shot. Agent Parr was breaking procedure by going to the hospital. It could be an attack on the government. The safest place is the White House. That's the Secret Service procedure. Yet, Parr is the president's agent in the limo right now, and he's the one who can throw procedure out the window. It's a decision that there's little doubt about saved Reagan's life. Now, this is a crazy situation. The way to the White House from the hotel had been cleared already by the Secret Service, but now driver Unre has to turn into traffic, and it's five blocks to GW. Two things that have to be on Parr's mind. One is that in the organization, the Secret Service, they're still suffering from the rap of losing JFK. It was a burden that everyone felt. Parr wasn't in the service at the time, but yet he felt it. The other was that Parr, who just passed away last October 2015, was encouraged to join the Secret Service by a movie he watched as a child. The man who starred in that movie was the president that he was in the limo with right now. Reagan had no idea what had happened to him. Perhaps his rib had been broken. 
I think I cut my lip, Reagan says to Parr. Frank Reynolds is now live on TV, but he's also got a phone to his ear. Technology in 1981. The president has not gone to the White House. We can now confirm that the president has been taken to a hospital. David Prosperi, James Brady's assistant, has just seen his boss shot right in front of him. There's no one immediately that can help. Lifting him or touching him might do more harm than good. Prosperi runs into a hotel to try to find a phone. He calls the White House. Shots fired. Brady's been hit. Deaver calls Jim Baker at the same time. The White House knows now. And a meeting goes on in the Situation Room. Secretary of State Al Haig is a commanding figure at this point in the room. The helm is here, he says. Haig sends a message to all embassies. Flash. You will have heard that there was an attempt on the life of the president. His condition is stable, and he is conscious. When Haig sends the memo, he's well aware that that might not be the case. The limo reaches George Washington University Hospital. President Reagan gets out of the limo. He's offered a stretcher and refuses. I'll walk. And Reagan walks to the doors of the emergency room at George Washington Hospital and goes through them as if he was there on a visit. His first concern was that no one be alarmed. And I think there's a lot to learn about Reagan in that moment. From the ambulance bay, nurse Kathy Paul expects an ambo to arrive and instead sees the President of the United States an agent by his side, walking into the front entrance on his own volition. She expected all of the party to come in by ambulance. She has to race over to the emergency room entrance, and as she does, Reagan walks in. The doors close behind the President of the United States. His knees buckle and collapse, and now Nurse Paul is holding him down. No wheelchair was immediately available. Minutes before, the call came to Nurse Paul that the president's motorcade was arriving. She had no idea what was to come, and now the president of the United States was in her arms. To his great objection, Reagan was frugal, she cuts off his very expensive suit and strips him so that doctors could find what was wrong. A terrifying discovery is made. Reagan's systolic blood pressure is 60. The normal is 140. And for a 70-year-old, well, most do not survive a drop like that. Nurse Paul says, as the blood pressure cap is put on, no pulse. Agent Jerry Parr, standing next to the president, never forgot those words, no pulse. As ABC, the State Department, the White House relays the calming words to the world, Parr is thinking, My God, we've lost another one. We've lost another president of the United States. Dr. Joseph Giordano gets a stat on his pager. This is rare. People would just come and find him. And he comes down. And he noticed a lot of well-dressed people and all kinds of cars out the hospital windows. Meanwhile, Michael Deaver, who was with the president, following along in a limo, now is dealing with a hospital intern. Sir, do you know the patient? Yes, Michael Deaver says. Do you know the patient's name? Reagan. First name? Deaver's incredulous. Ronald. Address? It's all Deaver can do at this moment to not freak out at the intern. 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Do you mean... Yes, Deaver said, annoyed. As Deaver would say later, my friend the president was now stripped to the skin, and the doctor was holding his coat up, trying to find a bullet hole. Reagan had lost all of his color, and his eyes were open and moist. Vice President Bush is on Air Force Two, flying from Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, where he's making a speech in Fort Worth, to Austin, Texas, where he was to address the Texas state legislature. He had been told in Fort Worth that the president was shot and not hit. 
So he went on with his plans to speak to the legislature. Now Secretary of State Haig makes a ground-to-air call to try to get to the Vice President. This is Secretary Haig, Mr. Vice President. Haig can't hear Bush and starts screaming. George, this is Al Haig. Air Force Two gets the message, or at least gets enough of it, and goes back to Washington after a quick refuel in Austin. The Vice President writes a note on a piece of Air Force notepaper. He writes his thoughts. Enormity of it comes upon me 20 minutes out of Austin. Pray, literally, that RR recovers. Call Barbara. Call Nancy. Fly to observatory. Not panic. Uncertainty. Unknown. At the hospital, Lieutenant Colonel Jose Mirati, who holds the nuclear football, a black attaché with the codes and cards and targeting options to launch America's nuclear arsenal, argues now with FBI agents. He wants card number one, the card that has those codes. The FBI wants it as evidence. The FBI wins. Rainbow, Secret Service codename for Nancy Reagan, the president's wife, arrives at the hospital now. Honey, I forgot to duck, he tells her. One of many jokes that Reagan will make and that will make its way to the press and folklore. Nancy's not fooled. I never saw him look so pale, she says later. Lynn Knopfsinger, press aide, calls Ed Rollin at the White House. The guy's in really bad shape, he relays. It is dark. How could it happen? In New Jersey, an elementary school student looks down. The president, leader, what was going to happen? Bruce Carlson realizes that he's looked at his feet now for too long. Time to get home. It's fall. It's getting darker faster. Jim Baker is chief of staff. He's at the White House. He's supposed to be at that AFL-CIO meeting, but his schedule wouldn't allow it. Too many things to do. An overwhelmed, first-time chief of staff, still learning a bit about the job. Needing the extra time. David Gergen, communications director, tells him, and Ed Meese along with him, up until now they were getting the news from the same place everyone else was, the TV. Gergen tells Baker there's a bullet hole found in a coat. They're at the hospital in 10 minutes, along with a lot of people, so many that Nurse Paul says it was hard for her to do the job that day with all the security and other watchers. Dr. Giordano says, It was clear the president lost a lot of blood. The doctors pumped fluid into him and glucose. That improved his tone. But there was an opening below his armpit and there was no breath at the side of his chest. The Troika, James Baker, Ed Meese, Michael Deaver, two of them, Meese and Deaver, were California people. Baker had a relationship with Vice President Bush. They ran the White House in the early going. Not the presidency, as I think it will become clear, but the White House, the planning, the schedule, the staff, the things that Reagan didn't weigh in on. Baker had connections with Bush and former President Ford. Baker was put in the job over Meese because it was known he could run things well and keep the president out of trouble. Deaver was there because of his long relationship with both Nancy and Ronald Reagan and because of his publicity skills, his ability to find the perfect TV background for Reagan's appearances. Meese was Reagan's conservative attorney general in California, which made the Troika accepted grudgingly at times by the right wing with Meese there. These three got along, managed. The story of Reagan was often a story of staff, 
Staff could shape a lot of policy in a presidency where the chief might keep to the big picture. And the troika worked. But today, for this group, it was all possibly over. At GW, there was still a problem with Reagan's breathing. Dr. Giordano said, We put a tube into his chest to draw out all the blood and to re-expand the lung. It did. 90% of the time, that stops the bleeding. This time, it didn't. A rush of blood came out, and we expected it to stop, but it didn't. X-rays couldn't find the bullet. Reagan's chest was cut open, and a tube put in. The thoracic surgeon had never seen a chest of a person of the age of Reagan that strong. It took twice the normal time to cut. This was a man who, at 70 years plus, chopped wood for exercise. In my two months on the job, I had been impressed with the president's vigor. Now he was ghastly pale. Meese and Baker decide not to use the 25th Amendment or transfer power to George Bush. He'd arrive soon enough. Power could be transferred later if there were complications in the surgery. White House counsel Fred Fielding draws up papers. But Baker's alert aide Richard Dawman would take them off the table and lock them in a safe. If the papers ever found out the 25th Amendment papers were even drawn up, that would be a news story. And that would look like chaos in the presidency. They didn't want it. Don Regan, Treasury Secretary, and also in charge of the Secret Service, would say that some of the information was flawed. After the fact, we understood that the threat to the president's health had been far greater than we realized. Reagan said there were a lot of questions about what to do. I kept wondering at what point would some staffer find a doomsday book with all the contingency planning of what we should do now. But no such book existed. Larry Speaks, the assistant press secretary, Jim Brady's been shot now, goes on the air. When asked who's in charge, she says, I'll have to get back to you on that. Al Haig from the Situation Room screams, Get that guy off! Haig will take the stage himself and say, I'm in charge here. The surgery takes longer than anyone expects. After hours of surgery, finally, the bullet is removed an inch from Reagan's heart. Finally, they are able to remove it. Reagan is stabilized. One of the first things the doctors hear when he's awakened is, So, what was his beef? It was 1981. A president had been killed less than 20 years before. And 20 years before that, a president had died in office. It was understandable that there would be an outpouring of joy to match the outpouring of sadness of those events. He passes a note to his nurse. All things considered, I'd rather be in Philadelphia. A reference to an older movie. George Bush arrives at 6 o'clock, the day Reagan shot, refuses to land in the South Lawn of the White House, refuses to sit in any other chair than a normal vice president's chair in any White House meetings that will take place, go over the world situation, go over the assassination details. They know pretty much a few hours after the shooting that there's no wide-ranging conspiracy that Hinckley is a loner, that he killed the president in an attempt to impress the actress Judy Foster, that if it was not for the president, there might be a shooting up at Brown University involving Hinckley and possibly Judy Foster or someone else. Reagan wasn't totally out of the woods. There would be recovery and the infection, which would lead to a perilous fever. Not commonly known. Here's what Jim Baker says about it. It was serious, frankly, and we may have come closer to losing him in the infection than in the shooting itself. White blood count was up, 103 degree fever. Doctors at GW put him back on antibiotics after having taken him off. And one of the doctors saying, we were living in a fantasy land about this amazing recovery. And so I think that so much time has passed that you have to put yourself back in that situation and how joyful the population was. 
Reality is, Reagan was lucky about a number of things. One is that the gun was a revolver of the type that was more common, say, in the street in 1981, the type of weapons we have now. That gun was a 22 caliber, lower than most. Now, it had an explosive round, but it did not go off. It was supposed to detonate on impact, but it did not go off. So it was just a 22 caliber bullet. He was lucky that the agents acted according to their training. That par went right to the hospital. Dr. Giordano said of uh, the president, if he was brought to the White House with no trauma unit, he would have died there in the White House. His physical condition helped him. The fact that the hospital had an expert trauma area designed to accommodate developments that had been made during the Vietnam War and trauma service. The Reagan presidency that we're going to discuss, that we observed 35 years later, almost didn't happen at all. At the time, his ambitious plan was stalled in Congress. His bravery was admired by all Americans. A Washington Post, ABC News poll indicated that the president's approval rating would jump from 62 to 73 percent. Even the stock market went up over a thousand big at that time. He laughed to death, Lynn Knopfinger would say later. A new legend is born, columnist David Broder would say. But as long as people remember the hospitalized president joshing his doctors and nurses, no critic will be able to portray Reagan as a cruel or callow or hope heartless man. He was a folk hero, Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill would say. Throughout this period, there's an attempt to keep the image of the presidency and the White House intact, that the presidency is running as normal. Staff meetings are held the very next day. There's a staff meeting at the hospital, and staff meetings are continued. During the first day, Reagan's unable to speak due to the chest surgery and the tube, and he writes several notes. One of the notes scribbled from the hospital when Democrats in Congress wish to change the president's tax plan, which was a proposal for a 10% tax cut each year for three years. Democrats wanted to phase it in, reduce it, maybe make it temporary. After all, this was being sold as an economic plan. If it's an economic plan, well, let's make it temporary, and then when the economy gets better, get rid of those tax cuts. No compromise, he writes. Reagan would proceed with a speech to Congress, accompanied by Agent Jack Parr and pointing to the surgeons and nurses at GW who assisted him. It didn't take long, though, for him to switch to business. My health has greatly improved. I wish I could say the same for the American economy. This is a bad time for the economy. High inflation, interest rates, high unemployment... With so many years past, it's hard to think of Reagan as a president who was focused domestically, right? But in the beginning, that's just the way it was. He was elected on the same basis as Clinton, same basis as Franklin Roosevelt to improve the economy. Reagan never would have passed a single tax cut if it was called that, nor a budget cut if it was called that. It was an economic plan, and he was utterly focused on it. Baker, his chief of staff, and quickly identified by some of the right wing as a leader of the more moderate faction of the Reagan presidency, said, A popular myth is that I blocked efforts to persuade the president to push legislation on school prayer, busing, abortion, and other social issues. That simply wasn't true. The president set clear goals, reduced taxes, cut the size of government, improved the military. Reagan worked Southern Democrats, the so-called Bo Weevils, and the Northern Republicans who were a little skittish about some of the budget cuts, the so-called Gypsy Moths. A Georgia congressman, elected with Carter from his own home state in 1976, said that he never talked to the president. In his first month, Reagan phones him. Same month, they have congressmen for dinner, including O'Neill and his wife, invites House members, Republicans and Democrats, over to watch the Super Bowl. 
and the outsider was playing a great inside game. There were at least three significant legislative victories that would have been difficult for any other president to pull off. The Kemp Roth plan, cutting taxes 23% over three years. The Graham Lotta bill of 800 pages with all sorts of measures and cuts. And a second, Graham Lotta II, and many other programs. Reagan had brought with him 34 GOP House members, new members, and 12 new senators on his election coattails. And that means Democrats lost that many. This made an impression. And the Senate had been controlled by Democrats, and now it was controlled by the GOP for the first time since Eisenhower. That made a real impression, essentially making the House and the Democrats there defense only. This was a popular president in their districts, be it in the North, the South, the West, and the Congress responded. Graham Lotta budget legislation passed the House so fast that many didn't get the chance to read it, said one congressman. It could have put us to war and we wouldn't have discovered it for weeks. Indeed, the page count at 800 pages of Graham Lotta puts in perspective the Obamacare legislation, although that was larger. And Graham Lotta passes the House with far less protest and trouble than Obamacare. What Reagan wanted was to aim at the great society. Graham Lotta and the subsequent 1981 bills made dramatic cuts in federal housing subsidies, Vista volunteers to inner cities, Pell Grants, Head Start. It's often said that Reagan tried to reverse the New Deal, which is interesting, as Reagan's father had a job with the WPA. Ronald Reagan, right out of college, could recite Roosevelt's Fear Itself speech by heart. He was a speaker in Harry Truman's Whistle Stop train tour and would introduce the president. Nearly became a candidate for Congress in 1952. Part of the reason he did not is that the Los Angeles County Democrats felt that Ronald Reagan, then the head of the Screen Actors Guild, would be seen as too liberal. The president that was now addressing a bad economic situation in 1981 came out of the Great Depression. That's why Tip O'Neill would call him a traitor to his class, the working class people of Dixon, Illinois. But Reagan always had another side to him. He was enterprising, and he liked successful business people. Now, he drew a line. Reagan didn't get along very well with people with old wealth, old money, inherited wealth. But he liked self-made millionaires a lot. He would get along with people like that. Right after college, when many of us think about what job we're going to take, he, the country was hit with the Depression. And Reagan had had a dream of going to Hollywood and becoming an actor. Instead, he leaves for Des Moines, Iowa to become a radio broadcaster. I mean, he first tries to go to Chicago and they tell him there are no jobs here. Every job that there is, there's a long list. And he says, they say, go to the sticks and make yourself known there. And he does. Becomes a radio broadcaster in Des Moines, famously calling football games that he could not see. He would add color and life to the news that he was getting. After some time, he'd take his car to Hollywood and would become a very quick success in the movie business. He would negotiate later with studio heads, become part of SAG, worked for GE as their spokesman, taking in a lot of pro-business rhetoric. This may have been responsible for his forceful conversion to the GOP, as well as Eisenhower, who he supported in 52 and who supported him when Reagan ran for governor in 66. When he ran for governor in 1966, he won by a million votes. And he beat Pat Brown, who was a force in California politics, and who had beaten Richard Nixon when, after his presidential run, he decided to run for governor of California in 1962. And yet Reagan came and beat the one who beat Nixon, Pat Brown. That got a lot of attention. And during the 60s, Reagan was a force to be reckoned with from the West. And during a lot of the Nixon presidency, there was a kind of thinking that Reagan was at least one of the people in the running for Nixon's successor. Reagan wholly defended Nixon on Watergate, never really backed down until the actual resignation of Nixon. Reagan would have a fantastic rookie year 
as his opponent, Speaker of the House Tip O'Neill, would admit. And someone asked Tip O'Neill how his first year in Congress was going, with a Republican president, a Republican Senate, and only a Democratic House to oppose things. Tip O'Neill said, I'm getting the blank beat out of me. Reagan may not have been a policy wonk, but he had no trouble asking Congress for a vote. Tell me who I should call and I'll take care of it. That's what he told his staff. O'Neill was quite jealous of that. I would have given my right arm for Jimmy Carter to say something like that. Carter had rarely called congressmen. Reagan had a great memory for certain facts and stories. And when Tip O'Neill tells him during a visit, everyone in Washington is friends after six, you know, kind of saying it as a joke. Later, he'd get a call. It's from the president. Tip, is it after six yet? These phone calls weren't really known at the time, but nowadays they are known, and they are part of the folklore. It might be too much, by the way. Reagan and O'Neill weren't fast friends, and they fought many battles. O'Neill called him cruel, called his actions rotten at times, a traitor to his class at times. Reagan's campaign would make O'Neill a punching bag in the upcoming midterm, with all sorts of commercials with fake Tip O'Neills in them. But he did make those calls, and they did talk very often. Tip, let me give you the latest. It's a little bit different than what we might think of now that they were good friends and after six they'd, they'd get out all the kinks and all the fights they were having during the day, but that wasn't really how O'Neill relates it. When Reagan would say, uh, let me give you the latest, he was talking about the World Series, a movie that was out, some kind of an old story, or an Irish joke. But despite having a good political performer in the White House, Reagan had a problem with his economic plan. He might be able to get some of these Southern Democrats, Bo Weevils, and throughout his presidency to have quite a coalition between GOP House members and Bo Weevil Democrats. He might be able to get them to pass legislation, but he didn't have the committees. In committee, a lot of things can happen. For instance, you can pass a bill, as they did, that says, we're going to do this supply side thing. We're going to cut Taxes, 10%, 10%, 10%. Actually, it ended up after a compromise, 5%, 10%, 10% the first three years. But the Congress also has powers to stretch things out, to make budget cuts, more about gimmicks. And so Reagan adapted a variety of tactics to get his, not only his initial legislation through, which he did, and for many presidents that would be a, he had his signing and it would be a big victory, but the actual legislation are as close to it as he wanted. He'd use his Southern Democratic allies, including a man named Kent Hance. Hance was a Democrat, and a few years earlier had just beat a Republican candidate named George W. Bush. But he took up Reagan's plan. Then Reagan appeared on TV. I had intended to make some remarks about the Probably Social Security tonight. But the immediacy of congressional action on the tax program, a key component of our economic package, has to take priority. Now, the day after tomorrow, Wednesday, the House of Representatives will begin debate on two tax bills. And once again, they need to hear from you. I know that doesn't give you much time, but a great deal is at stake. A few days ago, I was visited here in the office by a Democratic congressman from one of our southern states. He'd been back in his district, and one day one of his constituents asked him where he stood on our economic recovery program. I outlined that program in an earlier broadcast, particularly the tax cut. Well, the congressman, who happens to be a strong leader in support of our program, replied at some length with a discussion of the technical points involved but he also mentioned a few reservations he had on certain points. The constituent, a farmer, listened politely until he'd finished. And then he said, don't give me an essay. What I want to know is, are you for him or against him? His version passed 238 to 195. Reagan was controlling Congress from the White House, and no one had seen anything like it in nearly 20 years. 
and certainly nothing like it during the last three failed presidents. In an interview, the actor Bradley Whitford of TV's West Wing, who played the character Josh Lyman, once said, Of course the show covers a liberal administration. How is it going to cover a conservative one? Would it be a great TV moment to say, Yeah, we passed a tax cut. And yet here at this moment, I know there's a group of people listening who would like me to do that right now. Yeah, we passed the tax cut because this, this reduction coming at a time where inflation was rampant. It's so hard, by the way, I'm recording this in 2015, it's so hard, by the way, to understand even inflation because we haven't had it since Reagan's presidency. Once in a while, certain costs go up, real estate prices, gas, things like that. We really haven't experienced this overall inflation. This is what they were living through coming out of the 70s. And it was pretty easy, whether right or wrong, to draw a line between that and all the government spending that was going on, that it was causing inflation. They knew something was wrong and needed to be fixed. When municipal governments were in debt, bankrupt, over the top with union contracts, corrupt politicians, energy costs driving prices up, with gas lines, this stand was taken in a radically different direction, a first step in conjunction with cuts in federal programs, decreases in regulation, and a steep increase in the military spending, was to be the cure. So for a certain group, the moment should be a movie moment. As in, an American president introduced a new philosophy. But the change he would introduce in domestic and foreign policy was not just a difference from Democrats, but a difference from the GOP party he was a member of. And for us, observing American politics and history, it is true to say this. He created truly the politics we know today. It started here. The debates of today are far more rooted in 1980 than in 1970. Far more rooted in 1980 than 1935. The position of the two parties today is far more grounded in the Reagan coalition than anything that came before. Where the debate is ratcheted, no longer is it, is this program good or how much should we fund this program? But the debate is, should we do this at all? Who's going to do it? What is the effect of that? What groups benefit beyond the group we want to help? There are also new questions that developed. Who is left behind? Are we now assigning blame to individuals for misfortune? Did we only move from one extreme of government intervention rejected by voters to merely an imitation of pre-depression bootstrap on your ownism? When we ask these questions, we conjure up the roots of our politics, and the genie in that bottle is Ronald Reagan. So let us look at him all of the aspects. The conservative icon, the sometimes moderate, the everyman, the politician, the tax cutter, the tax increaser, the distant delegator, the deep thinker, the idealist, the compromiser, the peacemaking cold warrior, the actor, the union head, the governor, the president. Let's look at what he did as president. Let's look at what he and his friends thought he did as president. Let's look at what his critics thought about that. We'll look at the image that he has in our politics today. The hero worship, the bitter hatred, the disdain, the admiration, the sometimes overkill on all sides. Did he win the Cold War? Did he fix America? Did he introduce catastrophic cuts? Did he lie about a great scandal? Did he cut government? Was he right? Is he a great president? All of these things, all of these questions, we will look at. Starting with this moment. About two weeks after Reagan is released from the hospital, he fires off a letter to Leonid Brezhnev. Brezhnev had replaced Khrushchev. He's the Soviet Union's leader. He's the longest serving leader since Stalin. And he's arguably the most powerful, and some Russians think he's still the most effective 
and the most popular among many of them today when they look back at Soviet leaders. Fueled by 1970s energy prices, the Soviets are expanding, influencing Angola, Cuba, Nicaragua, Afghanistan, and the Middle East. Reagan fires off a letter to Brezhnev. He reminds him that the two had met at Nixon's White House in the 70s. When I met you, I asked if you were aware that the hopes and aspirations of millions of people were dependent on the decisions that would be reached in your meetings. And then he goes on. You took my hand in both of yours and assured me that you were, and that you were most dedicated in your heart to fulfilling those hopes and dreams. People of the world still share that hope. Indeed, the people of the world, despite differences in racial and ethnic origin, have very much in common. They want the dignity of having some control over their individual decisions. They want to work at the craft of their choosing and to be fairly rewarded. They want to raise their families in peace without harming anyone or suffering harm themselves. Government exists for their convenience, not the other way around. It is in this spirit, in the spirit of helping people of both our nations, that I have lifted the grain embargo. Reagan had recently lifted an embargo on grain sales that went back to the Carter administration. Perhaps this decision will contribute to full and constructive dialogue, which will assist us in our joint obligation to find peace. The letter finds no target. The letter comes back from Brezhnev later that chides Reagan for lecturing him on ideology. We can argue about Reagan. We can argue policy. We can throw numbers out, and I will. And you have to, because the numbers do change during the Reagan administration. Impact cannot be debated. Reagan had it. Camp Roth phased in 23% cuts in individual tax rates over three years. Top rate was dropped. It reduced windfall profit taxes for the oil industry. Accelerated depreciation deduct helped businesses. Allowed all working taxpayers to establish IRAs for their retirement. The capital gains tax was reduced from 28% to 20%. It expanded provisions for employee stock ownership plans. They had completely changed federal policy. And during Reagan's presidency, it would happen several more times. It was a great moment for the administration. But as Chief of Staff Jim Baker noted, in the first year, just as they were winning in Congress, we stepped into it on Social Security. If the lofty goals of Franklin Roosevelt, perhaps, were to expand the federal government's power to help people, and if a proponent of that role might be Harry Hopkins or Jim Farley, the Reagan administration had its idealists too. Its idea was that you could help people by reducing the same government. Its greatest advocate was a guy with a bowl haircut, spectacles, and a big fat binder. The face of budget change in the Reagan administration, 34-year-old former Congressman David Stockman. As a congressman, Stockman had voted against grants going to his district and against the Chrysler bailout, even though he was from Michigan, and there was a plant in his district that made parts for Chrysler. The plant, moreover, the owners, had been among his biggest supporters. He even canceled out programs his own sister worked for. He cut extra unemployment benefits for manufacturing workers. Just the normal benefits would do for everybody else, why not them? He respected farmers, but trimmed subsidies, cutting energy department subsidies as well. He cut $500 million from dairy subsidies. He also trimmed the programs that benefited big corporations, import-export loans, where giveaways to Lockheed, GE, and Boeing. He angered some in the Reagan cabinet, even the energy secretary put in the post specifically to trim the department, got angry. Reagan got his tax cuts passed through Congress, and he got various budget bills passed that called for budget cuts. Stockman was there to make those cuts. During the campaign, third-party candidate John Anderson had attacked Reagan, asking, 
How can you cut taxes and increase military spending at the same time and not run a deficit? Stockman said, easy. To make the plan, he would cut drastically in the federal government. There were no sacred cows for Stockman except the military. That was a mandate from Reagan. Even there, even as military spending increased, Stockman kept bringing it up to the boss. He wanted to review the waste. And Stockton was also part of a Social Security Committee, along with the Health and Human Services Secretary and a few others, and they began crafting, unbeknownst to the Chief of Staff and Reagan himself, a plan to partially pay for the budget cuts called for it by Gra in Graham Latta by reducing payments to Social Security recipients who retire early. Stockman knew not to run this one by Baker. He was always sounding the trumpet on Social Security. Indeed, Baker considered Social Security the third rail. It and defense were off the table, but Stockton wanted to test the sacred cows. Baker had shut down a proposal from a group of senators who tried to reduce the cost of living adjustments. He convinced the president that would be the same as a cut. That would be going against his pledge. A cut in colas might theoretically not be a cut, but it was money people were expecting. Baker couldn't shut Stockman's plan down because it hadn't been released yet. But it leaked, and all hell broke loose. President Southern Democratic Bo Weevil allies were complaining. Uh, GOP House members were complaining. News coverage was bad. Letters were negative, And President Reagan read his mail. But to top it off, the Senate votes 96-0 to to oppose any plan, even though it had not been announced yet. They just voted on a resolution to oppose any future changes in the early retirement benefit for Social Security. The president had stepped in a landmine. Some of the goodwill had been lost. The binder-carrying stockman, a presence at every meeting, drew the ire of some other people in the administration. Treasury Secretary Don Regan had no idea why Stockman was being invited to all these meetings when his department, technically in charge of this stuff, did not have a voice. An article published in The Atlantic by a friend of his did him in. Stockman thought that his friend, the reporter, were just talking and venting at meetings that they had at the Hayes Adam Hotel during the first year of the Reagan administration. No one knows what is going on with all these numbers, Stockton said in the article. Reagan's tax-cutting bill was just a Trojan horse giving a small tax cut to the lower brackets in order to get a tax break for the high-income taxpayers. This didn't look good. One of Stockman's problems was he had reprogrammed the OMB computer for better growth estimates and interest rates than Carter's team had called for, for 1981, 1982, 1983. This meant that the deficit was going to be larger than expected. His reprogramming and the resulting deficits were not talked about in the press or with Congress until the various Graham Lotta bills had been passed. Because the story of Reagan is almost always told with an agenda behind it, it's told with light or only with shadow. Reagan's presidency lasted from 1981 to 1989. It would contain moments the likes of which we had only seen in the presidencies of Herbert Hoover and Jimmy Carter. And it would contain great shining moments that made one think of John F. Kennedy or Franklin Roosevelt's speeches. He would enact policy change like Lyndon Johnson. And at least in one year, he would have a downfall that reminded everyone of Richard Nixon. And to many observers came close to the same result. Yet throughout this long two-term presidency, this long story, there are always good moments. A story of one day in the Reagan administration illustrates this. Tip O'Neill talks about a meeting in the White House where a bipartisan group was discussing unemployment. Tip O'Neill mentioned that the rate was 7%, still too high. The Reagan then said that it would be lower if the army was counted. Well, O'Neill shrugged and said, well, that's true, but it's always been true. Then Reagan said, those people can find jobs if they really want to. For O'Neill, it was symptomatic. He was getting steamed, Reagan went on. I'm told about the fellow on welfare 
who makes calls looking for work. On the third call, they offer him a job. And he hangs up. O'Neill is now livid, and everyone in the room can see. Don't give me that crap. The guy in Youngstown, Ohio, who's been laid off at the steel mill and has to make his mortgage payments. Your stories might work on your rich friends, not on us. Don't tell me he doesn't want to work. Reagan is a little bit shocked. Stammers a bit. Senator Alan Simpson, at this point, jumps in and asks them not to bicker. This can't do. You're the Speaker of the House. You're the leader of the free world. You two are always bickering. Sorry, O'Neill said. I just can't sit here and listen to him talk like this. I don't want my silence to be regarded as acquiescence. I have nothing but respect for the presidency. And then Reagan said, with the exception of this incumbent. O'Neill said he left that meeting, stormed out, angry, and a man that was so blind to the suffering of so many people. It was Reagan at his worst, he would write later. And then, shortly after the meeting, the Challenger space shuttle exploded. Seven astronauts were lost. And the president went onto television. The crew of the space shuttle Challenger honored us for the manner in which they lived their lives. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning, as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. Thank you. O'Neill was watching. And he said of the man who he had just had this argument with, he spoke to our highest ideals. As I listened to him, I had a tear in my eye and a lump in my throat. This is part one.